flying is one of the threats to the environment. But what exactly is it about flying that causes so many problems and why are these issues so difficult to actually resolve? Well, firstly, there's the issue of passenger numbers and efficiency. Aircraft, like most other pieces of machinery and technology, becoming more efficient all of the time. However, due to increases in global incomes, relatively low cost of flying, and growth of global population, the slight improvement in efficiency being more than offset by increases in passenger numbers, with passenger numbers increasing about 6% year on year, with over 4 billion passengers being flown each year, any increase in efficiency just can't match those numbers. And we have the issue of a relatively low price of jet fuel, using a variety of kerosene. Price of fuel does fluctuate quite a bit, which is normally the reason for the surcharge on the price of some flights. However, part of the reason for these quite wild variations in the price airlines pay for kerosene is that compared to most other fuels, kerosene is undertaxed. Now, part of this dates back to the 1944 Chicago Convention, which has been fairly constantly revised ever since. But one of the key things the authorities wanted to do was to avoid any form of double taxation on fuel carried by the plane. So if a plane took off in country A with a fuel tank that was full and paid tax on that fuel in country A. If it then landed in country B with half a tank of fuel, they shouldn't have to pay tax on the fuel in their tank. Now, every major country, virtually all of the smaller ones, have signed up to this agreement. But in addition, they also signed many bilateral and multilateral agreements on flying, especially relating to fuel. It meant that rather than just avoiding double taxation on jet fuel, fuel isn't taxed at all. Part of the logic behind this is to avoid planes fueling up in a low tax country and using that fuel to fly between two high tax countries. Without any international agreement on what the level of tax on aviation fuel should be, the airlines have been virtually able to avoid paying any tax at all on aviation fuel. It's led to the airline industry not working as hard as they might towards more efficient aircraft, as well as being able to undercut the prices of some other means of transport which are paying substantial amounts of tax for their fuel. Now, flying itself is very weight critical. The more mass you have to lift off the ground, the more energy it's going to take to do the lifting. It's especially relevant when thinking about the fuel. So, for instance, a 747 jumbo jet flying long distance may be carrying up to 200 tonnes of jet fuel on board, or about half its takeoff weight. So, in essence, in a long flight, a lot of that fuel is actually being used to transport the fuel. Well, it's one of the key reasons that types of kerosene are used to fuel jet aircraft. So these fuels deliver a large amount of power for the given weight of fuel. It can present some serious issues when trying to move aircraft towards something other than fossil fuels like kerosene. It's possible to power an aircraft using electricity in the form of batteries, but batteries don't produce anywhere near the amount of energy for the weight that kerosene does. So if you wanted to fly long distance, virtually all the weight would have to be batteries, leaving very little left over for the passengers, making alternative power sources for flight difficult to achieve. Another environmental issue with aircraft is where the waste gases like carbon dioxide from the engines are deposited. Now for motor vehicles, this happens just a few inches from the ground. Whilst this causes some major problems for people near the fumes, it does create the opportunity for gases to be processed by the local environment, including nearby plants absorbing carbon dioxide for use in photosynthesis. However, most of the fumes from the engines of jet planes are deposited thousands of feet in the air, right when they represent the greatest threat to the atmosphere, and where very little of it can be quickly reprocessed by nature. The other issue with depositing gases that high up in the atmosphere is that out of sight of the people on the ground, to a certain extent, out of the minds of the people on the ground. If the cars in the city start to produce so much pollution that it affects the people walking by, then they might start to put pressure on governments to reduce the effects. With aircraft, 
Unless you're wandering about outside, in and around an airport runway, which isn't normally allowed, you don't have any direct experience of what quantities of pollutants the planes are emitting. Plane emissions, of course, are not even limited to one country or even a region, so they're emitted all along the flight path. They can drift or circulate around the world from that point, meaning that even if one country has tight rules on aircraft emissions, they can fall afoul of emissions from outside of their jurisdictions. And while the most obvious form of pollution from aircraft is carbon dioxide, it also releases nitrogen oxides and sooty particulate matter, including ultrafine particles. However, what's less well known is that many airline fuels still contain lead. It's mainly because some of the generally older planes can't use existing unleaded alternatives. So whilst a car might be running on unleaded fuel, your airplane might not be. While passenger flying is responsible for a huge proportion of the flights, it's often overlooked that planes also carry large amounts of freight around the world. Some of this freight might be letters and parcels carried in the luggage hold of passenger flights, or might be whole flights dedicated to shipping goods around the world. So it's difficult to say what contribution freight is making to this issue. What does seem to be the case is we need international action rather than just national action on reducing the impact that flying is having on our atmosphere. Depending on how you measure it, Airplane flights contribute between 2 and 3% of all human controlled greenhouse gas emissions, a proportion which is likely to rise as other emissions are brought under control and as passenger numbers continue to rise.